Okay, so as I had said, I am Tim Lightfellow with the uh, nickname of Prod Killer. I underwent neck fusion surgery back in 2010 and switched to crossbow and have broken 13 prods in about 10 years, hence the nickname. Uh, because, well, crossbow's pretty much all I shoot all the time. This class, uh, I called it nude archery. It's the best kind of description I can come up with. The idea of it is kind of introduction of what types of gear we use, uh, and then kind of what you can expect on an archery range. Because watching it from a distance, it can be rather intimidating seeing all these waves of people who know exactly what they're doing, and they all kind of move in unison up and down the range and know when to shoot and when not to. And so the goal of this was to try and make you a little more aware of what you're going to experience when you walk on a range so it's hopefully not as intimidating to do so because we're all friendly and sometimes we're over friendly and overbearingly friendly <clears throat> and if we are tell us you know just say thanks but okay so uh let me switch i've thankfully got two screens up uh, so i'm switching to my class layout uh, so the first thing I want to go over is the equipment we use. Uh, we are SCA, medieval reenactment, so we are doing traditional equipment only, which means no compound bows, no carbon or aluminum uh, metal arrows. So we do wood, wood arrows and we do non-compound bows that are of a traditional style. They could have been made today or yesterday, but they're of a traditional style. So the first thing I would like to do is get a couple pictures open, and I think that Teams will let me share the photos. Okay. So first thing you'll tend to see on an archery range is something similar to this, which is a bow stand full of everyone's bows because when we retrieve our arrows, we leave our bows uh, back by the shooting line. We don't carry them with us. So um, let's see if it's going to let me scroll through. It is. Okay, so the most common type of bow we use is a recurve bow. Uh, this particular one, actually I should ask, is this visible? I didn't, it's showing on my screen, does it? Okay. <laughs> Making assumptions, not good. Okay, so this is a takedown. Uh, you'll notice that at each at the top of each of the limbs, there's actually a bolt that holds it to the uh, handle or riser. Um, recurves are definitely the more modern looking of what we shoot. Uh, they can have a metal riser. They can be a wood riser. The limbs can have carbon fiber on them. They can be fiberglass laminate. They can be straight wood uh, doesn't matter as long as they're a recurve a lot of the modern risers have holes in them through the side and we do ask those to be covered up to try and preserve the more period appearance um, what makes this a recurve is if you look out at the ends of the limbs the uh the, they curve back uh, out towards the front of the bow and so even when strung, they curve back a little bit, and so hence the recurve, because they curve down to the string and then back up towards the front of the bow. Moving on to the next type. Uh, this is, these can be recurve or longbows. These are solid fiberglass. They're mostly sold and seen used for kids because places like Target, Fred Meyer, and that sell these kinds of bows. Uh, most of them now are green, but they can be any color. Uh, and these are literally just a bunch of uh, however many layers of fiberglass that they use to make them the draw weight that they're making. This would be technically a type of recurve, but referred to as a horse bow. They tend to be shorter in overall length because they're designed to be shot off the back of a horse. And the longer the bow, the more it's going to 
hit the horse as you're trying to shoot, so shorter is better. Um, again, it's still a recurve. You'll notice that the limb curves down towards the string, and then at the very end, it actually curves back up towards the front of the bow a little bit. These have fixed limb ends. They're made out of wood. They're referred to usually as sias. I've heard some other words for them too that I suddenly can't remember. Um, so just part of the terminology. These are actually, if you unwrap the leather, you would see that they're a fiberglass laminated bow underneath. Okay, long bows. Long bows can be in all kinds of different types. The one on the bottom here, some people would refer to as a flat bow because it's not an English D, which means if you do cut a cross section, it's it's flat. It's not doesn't have a rounded belly on it. The belly of the bow is the part that faces you. The face of the bow is the part that faces downrange. Again, trying to help with terminology. Um, Long bows tend to be in what you can see is kind of a D shape when they're strung up, which is to say they tend to just be one continuous curve. They can curve slightly back out at the ends in a style that's referred to as a reflex deflex long bow, which means it curves both directions, but not to the extent that a recurve bow does. What I'm showing in this picture is both a, oh, just a moment. Someone else is trying to join and Teams is a little weird about this. Okay. I let them in. Okay. Uh, and I jumped. Okay. So what I'm showing in this picture is the bottom one is literally a wood bow with bamboo laminate. So it would be a more traditional looking type of longbow. The one on top is uh, actually a modern made one. It's from bear archery. And so the limbs are fiberglass laminate. Yeah, we have more people joining. OK, so again, longbow category, but you can have modern materials or um, non-modern materials just so it functions as a longbow. And we get into other things if you start looking at period gear versus, eh, come on, cat, that's the keyboard. <laughs> OK, so you start talking period. The one on the bottom would work for the period category because there's no shelf or anything cut into it, whereas the top one, you're shooting off a cut-in shelf which makes it more of what's referred to as a center shot, which means the arrow's going straighter instead of having to bend around the bow, which is bending around the bow's period style. And shooting off a shelf is modern, so that would work for longbow, but not period longbow. Uh, crossbows. Um, pretty much every single one I've seen is made out of wood. They have different release mechanisms, like the one on the left here has what's called a roller nut. The one on the right has what's called a clap lock. You can't really see the detail very well from here. It's just different styles of string release. Um, the one on the left has a steel prod. The one on the right has a fiberglass prod. Both of these are perfectly legitimate for both period crossbow and open crossbow. What we don't allow is the modern ones like the um, the pistol grip crossbows. We don't allow uh, rifle butt for period style. I think we're actually. OK, I'm being told that the picture's not visible or is it? I can see it. OK. Just making sure. Because my cat's between me and the camera, so. I have um, the same problem. <laughs> ah, there's Athlena and Aaron Bobbert. Yo. Hello. Hey. So uh, for crossbow, um, 
again, any of the, what we don't allow is the modern ones with like the metal rails for the cr bolts, the ones that shoot the uh, the compound style crossbows, uh, things like that. We expect uh, to see pure wood uh, period style crossbows on the range. I think that's the last one for that. So any questions? about uh, bow types that you'll see on archery ranges. Sight, sights on a crossbow. Sights on the crossbow. You are allowed a rudimentary rear sight. Um, different people have taken that to mean different things. Kenneth of Shaftesbury used um, as I recall, earthquake strapping that he formed in the shape of an L and used the holes in it as his sight windows. Um, and then I saw someone who used, I think they had a little screw and a receiver and they would literally twist the screw up and down to certain marks to use for their elevation. Um, certainly not allowed to put scopes on them or, <laughs> and you're not allowed a front sight. Uh, I'm not entirely sure all the reasoning for that, but some of it, I think, is that it starts making it look like it's actually a center shot because the way some of the scopes or sights mount on front uh, can confuse people. Uh, the other thing is I don't know that there's any actual documented front sights in period that have caused them to reevaluate the rule. So. Um, I myself choose not to shoot with sights, but yes, Thomas. It's probably worth noting that that will be kingdom specific. So if other people are watching this in the future from other kingdoms, then you'll need to check your specific kingdom rules. True. Um, yeah, some of that is. So the the base definition of what's allowed is actually a society, but yeah, some of the specifics like sites and that can be defined by kingdom. Uh, which can make it interesting when you have something like an inter-kingdom archery competition, trying to make sure everyone's following the same rules with the same equipment for it. Antonio. Can you just have like a notch or something in the the loop that goes at the front that you hold on to when you're pulling it to restring it? There we go. Sorry, was busy trying to anti-cat the camera. <laughs> so there, there's a, a, a steel loop at the front of the crossbow that mm. you step on to pull right, the string the stirrup. back up. Yes. Yeah. So couldn't you put a notch there in the middle of that steel at the center point and use that as part of your sight? Um, if you... If you don't have it marked as a sight, you could probably get away with it. But to be honest, the crossbow bolt goes over that part, so you wouldn't see it anyway. Uh, so that's why what I actually use is the tip of the crossbow bolt, because it's what you can see sticking off the front of the, the crossbow. Apparently, by moving the camera, I've offended the great cat. <laughs> OK, any other questions? Okay, so the next thing then is arrows. Um, as we mentioned, no carbon, no aluminum, that applies to crossbow and to uh, bows. So what most people shoot, and I'm hoping this is fairly visible in the camera, is either three or four fletch. It's a wood arrow. And this has a plastic knot glued on. So we allow plastic, horn. Uh, there are now companies that actually make wood glue-ons, which we are allowing for, actually the whole society is allowing for period shooting now. Um, and this is a typical arrow. And again, it's made out of wood. You can use bamboo or any type of wood. Most wood arrows are cedar or spruce. I've seen some ash. I've made some hickory. Uh, 
so pretty much any type of wood out there, people have probably used it at some point to make arrows with. Um, and all of them are allowed, as, again, as long as they're not a carbon. We've seen some that are fiberglass that looked very much like wood. Someone came to our practice like twice in a row, and we didn't catch it till the second practice and looked at it and went, that's a really weird, consistent patterning. Oh, that's fiberglass, not wood. So we had to let them know, yeah, you can shoot it for practice, but not submitting scores, because that's not legitimate equipment for shooting scores. So um, what we have is we have the, the knock, is the back end where it goes on the string, just to cover some of the uh, terminology. Fletches are the feathers, which we don't allow plastic veins, which are modern. Uh, we require feathers or period-like. So. I think some people have played around with like some wood uh, fletches uh, with some linen, uh, things like that to see how they would fly. Uh, so if it's a period material for a fletch, it's allowed. I've also seen parchment yeah. used. Uh, for tips, we use field tips. We can also use as I realize I have the example right near me, so I don't have to go running for it. We are allowed to use what they refer to as modified bodkins, which bodkins are basically a long tip with kind of a bulb at one end. I'm not sure with me behind it how visible it is. Um, these are a touchy subject with some because you can get this style where the bulb is the same diameter as the shaft, and these are allowed. You can get some where the bulb is actually a larger diameter than the shaft, and at that point it's up to the marshal in charge of the range, because at that point it's causing more damage to the target butt, because the only thing stopping it is just that very front, which means all the rest is just pushing it as far as it can through the target. Whereas with the ones that are the same diameter, you have the whole shaft of the arrow causing friction and slowing it down, so it does less damage to the target butt. Yes, Antonio. So do you never use the the stereotypical like pyramid shaped arrowhead? The uh, I have not. It looks like Athena probably is has. Yeah. So um, for those ones, at least in on tier, if you're going to use a broadhead or an actual bodkin, I don't have any handy to me within reach, I don't think. But um, if you're going to use those, um, coordinate with your marshal in charge and get them to talk up to the kingdom archer. Uh, you do need special permission to do that. That said, you know, Kingdom Archer, usually as long as you communicate with them, will be like, okay, cool, you know, have fun playing, what's your safety plan, and then stuff. But, I mean, I have shot sharp broadheads, but you have to kind of make a special situation for it. Yeah, and part of that is, again, it's up to the marshal if they feel it'll cause too much Absolutely. damage to the target yes. butts. So. Yes, yeah. it comes down Absolutely. to the damage of the target butts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we've been fortunate in Wywood is that we're using bulldog targets, which are a manufactured, designed for hunting and compound bows target butt. So generally, if we have someone show up the first time and they brought their compound gear, we can usually at least allow them to shoot. And then we'll explain to them, you know, we don't allow that within the society for scoring. You would need to get this kind of gear, but we can at least not just turn them away and you know ruin their day we can hopefully at least involve them and get a chance to talk and educate and so um, but yeah it, again it's all up to what you have and what the marshal thinks it's going to do to their targets okay so for period style again this is just a slightly different version but it's still a field tip um, so and then period style, or what they usually call self knock. So instead of having something glued on, literally you've cut a knock into the shaft of the arrow. 
This particular one has an insert as well, which uh, stabilizes and strengthens the end. So usually that's a harder wood because it's there just for strength so that it's less likely to snap the end with the pressure of the string. Um, this particular one that I actually just got does not. In fact, it uses this is a bamboo, and so they're doing a uh, wood that actually sticks into the back of the bamboo and comes out and spreads out for the knock. Um, you'll notice the string on these. I would say on this one, it's pretty much required to hold this in. On this one, it's pretty much just for looks. Uh, most period arrows are made in a way that the string is for looks rather than uh, truly a functional thing like it would have been in period. So in period, what you would tend to see is the front of this would be it would have a bunch of string around it to lock the front of the fletch down. You would see windings of the string through the fletch to hold the fletch down. And then you would see string at the back to lock the back end of the fletch down. And so in, in period, it was very functional. Uh, a lot of them now it's more for the period look because we glue these down to make sure they're going to stay on the shaft. Uh, OK, moving on to crossbow bolts. This is a short version of a crossbow bolt, but still has all the same pieces. So most of us who shoot crossbow in on tier shoot ones that do not use a knock at all. So the back of the bolt is literally flat, so the string can just push it. Um, every once in a while, you'll find someone who cuts a little groove in for the string to push against. Uh, all of that's allowed. And again, still just a field tip that's on the front. This one happens to be a screw on style. And so it's a little bit longer and a little bit more tapered than what we typically see for glue on, but it's still just a field tip. It's still the same diameter as the shaft, so it's not going to cause extra damage. And the fletches are still feather fletches. Any questions about arrows or crossbow bolts? The difference between three and four fletch arrows might be useful for people just starting. Okay, so really, um, again, I actually have three and four fletch here, so I can show you. So. Um, Four fletch tends to be used more, I think, by people who are a little more experienced who don't want to care how they knock their arrows on timed ends. Because you can knock this this way or the opposite way, the fletches are still aligned the same. With three fletch, you have one arrow, or one fletch, excuse me, that is lined up so that with the string here, you're going to have one fletch that's sticking straight out. So that actually goes towards you when you're shooting so that it doesn't push against the bow. And so on a timed end, you have to be more conscious of that and make sure you get the arrow flipped the right way when you put it on the string and shoot. There are some exceptions. Um, a lot of people have found, you know, at 20 yards, it doesn't necessarily matter. Just get the thing on the bow and shoot it. <laughs> um, but that is the big difference. Um, if you shoot, you know, even shooting your standard ends 40 yards or whatever, uh, if that's pushing towards the bow, it's going to kick the back of the arrow out a bit when it goes by. So it is going to make your shooting more inconsistent. Thanks, Harold, for bringing that up. That's a, a good point. Any other questions, comments? New. Okay, so we'll move on to the idea of dominance, eye dominance, hand dominance. Um, some people are very right handed or very left handed, and that's the way they're going to shoot because that's the only way they can do it. Perfectly fine. Some people figure out their eye dominance, and there are some tests you can do. Um, the biggest one is usually holding your hand so you kind of form a triangle looking at something out in the distance. You close one eye and then the other, and you see which one your picture shifts more on, and that's usually your 
let's see if I remember that right. That's usually your weaker eye is the one it shifts more on. The one that per mostly matches what you see with both eyes open is your dominant eye. So, so there are. Go there ahead. Are, go ahead. So no, OK, my headset's feeding back on me. So there are a couple so there of. Are a couple of Try it now. Still. OK. OK. Muting everyone. OK. Here we go. Okay. No. Oh, it's Everard. No. Oh, it's Everard. And Hello. his hand is up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. Um, actually, I think you're, you, there are two tests, and you're, and you're combining the two of them. Okay. The first one is usually the okay. thumb, and that's the one where you close each eye individually, and that's the one that it, how it moves on you. And then the other one, when you form the triangle, is you, you hold it out and then draw it back to your face. Whichever one it, eye it goes to is the one that is dominant. Ah. ah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So there are kind of two thoughts one is that i've heard some people is that you should shoot to your eye dominance all the time no matter what some people say you know what eye dominance doesn't matter hand dominance you can adjust um, there are clear benefits if you shoot with your dominant eye as far as sight pictures uh, but then we have someone like Arian the Wanderer who shoots uh, with his non-dominant eye because he that's his dominant hand and he just closes that eye and I, I think anyone who knows him can can attest that he's a successful archer. So um, it can definitely help, but it isn't necessarily the end all be all on how you have to shoot. Um, if you do find that your eye dominance is not your e not the same as your hand dominance and you want to try the other way, absolutely go for it. You may find you're more successful. It may be more of a struggle and you end up switching back. It's it's an individual thing. Uh, any questions on that before we move on to another topic? Figure it's better to ask after each topic and rather than have people forget what they were going to ask. Harold, yes. Helps, just sec, you're muted, and I can't unmute you. So if you can unmute yourself, please. <laughs> White Teams lets me mute, but not unmute. I do not understand. Nope, still muted. Yeah, it doesn't give me an unmute option. Yeah, it's going to be inside the Teams window, not the computer mute and unmute. So there's probably going to be a little microphone somewhere that you have to click on. You're still muted. Yep. OK, is it something you could type in chat then so we can? Hey, Tim. Well. We're waiting for him to see if he can resolve that. One other comment. When it comes to eye use, I guess the typical advice is try and keep both eyes open unless you're trying to overcome some sort of dominance issue. And some people don't like doing it that way and they'll just do one eye. But I think the common wisdom tends to be keep them both going or open. Yeah, and I will say that's for handbow. Um, for crossbow, you what I find typically is I do want to close one eye so that I'm sighting straight down the bolt. Since for crossbow, you're leaning over and you're, so you want the one that's like right down the bolt to be the one you're sighting and figuring out your picture window with. Okay, I'm going to see if it'll show me chat. It is. OK, choosing eye hand governs whether you use right. Yes. Yeah, so what he's pointing out is what type of bow you get would 
be based on if you go by I dominance, hand dominance, because um, bows, with with the exception of most period style bows, because most of them don't have cutout shelves, um, bows are right-handed or left-handed only typically. Uh, so recurve bows, long bows with cutout shelves are they're cut out for right-handed shooting or left-handed shooting. Can you hear me now? I can. Yeah, there you go. Uh, most uh, most groups, when they have learner gear, and most will have learner gear, will have one bow which is left and right-handed. In other words, it's got a rest on both sides of the bow. So it's, it's not a, an issue. Uh, you should try both if you've got any question as to you know which way you should shoot. Just get one of these bows and try both ways and see which way is more comfortable for you. Yep. So for instance, I'm ambidextrous, so I spent probably the first six months shooting half a practice right-handed and half a practice left-handed until uh, someone who later became my Erica said, you know, if you want to improve, you better choose one. <laughs> because switching back and forth all the time doesn't really get you consistent. <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> okay, um, so on to the next topic, which is the different shoots we do in uh, on tier, since everyone here is on tier. Uh, royal rounds, which are actually, from what I've found through people I've talked to, they are done in every kingdom, though Drakenwald scores theirs differently than we do. Um, so for adults, royal rounds are shot at 20 yards, 30 yards, and 40 yards, and then we have a timed end at 20 yards. Um, we shoot six arrows per end. And so usually when we have like new archers, so when they start practicing, usually we'll start them with three arrows because they're so busy working on form and, and exactly what they're doing. And then as they get used to the form and that, we'll step them up to six arrows and for shooting. Um, so royal rounds are what is most used within our kingdom. It's what you'll see on the scores site for people's averages, for people's rankings. Uh, and it's broken out by the bow types that we went over earlier. So open, longbow, crossbow, period recurve, period longbow, period crossbow would be the six adult categories. There is discussion of possibly making a separate category for horse bows. Haven't heard where that's gone yet, if, um, if it's going to happen or if it's still being debated or if it's been decided not so um icax oops antonio is that is that horse bow from horseback or is that its own category uh so horse bow from horseback is equestrian archery so that's a different thing they have their own rules about what constitutes scoring rounds um which yeah i was involved in getting that uh helping them get that together and online so that they have them posted. Um, part of their challenge is, so for horses, they can generally do either one shot per pass, or I think it's three shots per pass, depending on the speed they're going and distance of the target. And part of that depends on what they have available for uh, horse places in the area, because, you know, I mean, archery, if you have, 60 yards you have a practice field um equestrians you have to have the lead up the shooting space and then the lead off and space for multiple horses so they can be safe while the one horse is doing their pass and so some for some of them they can only really get a one shot set up uh within their arenas but yeah so equestrian is different it's its own category we are still they shoot it at events mostly because, again, that's mostly when equestrians are actually getting together and, and doing horse activities. And so there hasn't exactly been a lot of scores submitted. In fact, I don't think any have yet. 
Uh, we literally just put the scores rules up last year, so it's it's in its infancy right now. Um, so okay. otherwise, horse bows, what I'm referring to is standing like you would for any of the other bow types. And uh, one thing I will point out is they can be shot off either side. So you'll see people with thumb rings, they'll knock the arrow on the side away from their body because uh, that's the way thumb ring draw is designed. It literally pulls it back into the bow, whereas normally with fingers, you're pulling it into the bow the other way. So, yeah, there we go. Hey, Tim? Yes. A uh, couple of different things I'd kind of like to bring out. Hopefully, I'm not going to step on your toes. But from a newcomer perspective, there are a couple of things. When you're shooting a royal round, the rounds have to be shot consecutively. It doesn't really matter what order you do them in, but they have to be done consecutively. So you have to do your sure. 40, 30, 20, 20 timed, or you can do your 20 timed, your 30, your 40, and your 20 static. It doesn't matter, but you can't take a break in between them. You can't you Actually, know, shoot you an can take time. a break. Uh, you just break. can't practice in between. Yep. And then the other thing that is from a newcomer perspective that I'll kind of emphasize a little bit is that newcomers tend to, I'll say, obsess about getting off a lot of arrows during the timed end. And mm -hmm. you have to really be contemplating what's going to give you the best score. You know, four good, well-placed arrows is going to be better than 10 misses. <laughs> And just think about that as a newcomer and don't obsess about getting too many arrows off. Obsess about getting good quality shots off. Yeah. Yeah, what we normally tell people is shoot it just like you did your static 20. Just at your pace and find your aim point and shoot and however many you get off is however many you get off. You will speed up as you shoot them more. Uh, good points. Um, Let's see, so the next thing was the ICAC, which is literally two royal rounds plus timed ends, two timed ends at 30 and two timed ends at 40 yards. So it's just a lot more shooting, uh, but it's still the same distances. And then we also in Ontario shoot the York, the version we shoot, uh, because uh, Thomas shared with me some of the modern archery rules in that uh, ours is a different scoring system than they follow so our york is 12 ends at 100 yards eight ends at 80 yards and four ends at 60 yards so pretty much if you think about this is a three three to five hour shoot it's kind of the archery iron man as it were <laughs> um, our scoring is one through ten so outer each color is split in half. So outer white is one point, inner white two, outer black three, inner black four, and so on. So it's one through 10. Uh, in modern, I think it's Longbow Society rules that Thomas shared with me, they score it, was it one through, or three through seven? It was kind of an interesting scoring but it's, it's yeah, different than the way we numbers, do it. Basically. Oh, that's and right. The other numbers part, instead. Yeah. But the other part I'll mention is that it also is on a target that's twice as big as the normal Royal Round target. So it's 122 centimeter target. Yep. So, yeah. so it seems like it's difficult and it is very difficult from the distance wise, but it is a much bigger target to hit. <laughs> Try it. It's fun. <laughs> And as you can imagine, for a 100-yard target, that means our safety zone, it, you have to have at least 150 yards to have this shoot. And you have to have, I got the rules changed because the way the rules were written, you literally had to have 100 yards to each side of the target for a safety zone. And I said, that's absurd. I've been shooting Yorks for many years now, and not once have I seen anyone go more than about 8 to 10 yards off to the side. So we should have more than eight to 10 yards, but 100 yards is insane and most of the sites can't handle that. So uh, it's been rewritten. So it ends up being, I think, 20 to 25 yards off each side for the safety zone. Uh, okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. So within target archery, those are the things we usually do. Um, there are, of course, you know, prize tournaments and novelty shoots that people come up with that are totally separate. They're 
usually one-time shoots. They're scored on their own thing, and they're not um, not part of like our top ten list or anything like that. So, uh, any questions about? Some of that will make more sense once you actually get on a range and start practicing and shooting and, and learning. So no questions, but if I can make a couple other comments, there's another category of shoot called the Society Seasonal Archery Competition or SSAC. They typically change every three months and it is society wide. So when you're shooting, you're basically shooting across everyone or against everyone in the known world. Uh, so those are some of the other fairly frequent and they tend to fall in the kind of the category of the novelty shoots that Tim is referring to. So they do something a little bit different every time. And so it just breaks a little bit of the monotony of shooting Royal rounds all the time. Uh, Royal yeah. rounds are within the kingdom from a scoring competition perspective. Uh, the ICAC and the SSAC are both society wide. So when you, accumulate scores on those, then you can actually compare them to everyone in the known world. Yeah, right. yeah so, so on the scores site, they have something they refer to as the Grand Archery Tournament, mm -hmm. which is they take all the archers from all the kingdoms who have shot the ICACs, the SSACs, or any novelties in that that have been submitted for credit and approved and they have a scoring system so you can compare yourselves to other archers in other kingdoms through that venue um, not everyone cares but it is out there okay um so next topic is kind of an overview of bow care so the actually i don't, don't think i need to hold it for this one so um the big thing is we don't dry fire bows. That's like taking a gun and shooting it without ammunition in it. All the energy is going into the weapon and can eventually cause damage and failure. Um, so again, dry fire is pulling it to a draw and just letting go and letting the string hit without having an arrow on the bow. Uh, we don't generally store bows strung up. Uh, I know some people do store their crossbows strung up. Crossbows are a different thing. Um, I take mine down anyway, but uh, what that can do, especially unlike the, the one piece wood longbows, is it can actually start to shape them permanently so they lose all the energy that they add. So um, you can end up where it's like a 30 pound, a, a bow marked as a 30 pound draw weight. And when you test it, it's like 25 or 20 because it's shaped itself to being strung up. Um, so that's, uh, we don't store on end because that can actually twist the limbs. Uh, what limb twist is, is literally, let me use a demo on this one if I can. Be careful. Okay, so limb twist is like if this end gets torqued and twisted, so the string no longer sits straight from across the top and bottom. So normally the string goes through the center of the handle, and if you get a, a twisted limb, the string will be shifted to one side or the other, which then affects your uh, shooting consistency. It also can affect the energy of the bow, and it can get bad enough that the bow is not safe to shoot anymore. So if you store it on end, it has the chance because all the weights on that limb, it has the chance that it can end up twisting the limb. So what we, you know, what I've seen people do is like for that bow, they might take the string and hang the string on a hook so that the, the pressure is on each end of the string uh, where it crosses the bow. So it distributes the weight. Um, putting them on hooks on like a wall mount so that the limbs are sitting on hooks. Um, I've seen that done. In fact, we did it with clothes hangers, with coat hangers that we bought at the store. We put them side by side and put the bows on them. Uh, again, crossbows, some people store them strung up, some don't. It doesn't seem as if it really makes a difference on those because of the metal prods. Uh, 
Let's see. So don't dry fire, don't store strong, don't store on end. Uh, one other thing you want to do with any bow is wax the string regularly. If you don't wax the string, and again, this is something that someone can talk to you more about in person. It makes more sense if you see it, but we use like a beeswax or beeswax mix. And what it does is it keeps the string from fraying and breaking uh, just because if it dries out, it can fray and then break and then you have to get a new string. Waxing it extends the life of the, the string. Uh, let's see, so I think for bow care, that's most of the simple stuff. Um, any questions on that? No? Okay. I want to get into a question, but I did have one other comment. When you're on the range, if it's a very hot, sunny day, Northwest is a little bit different, but do not leave your bow sitting out on a bow rack in the sunlight for an extended period of time strong. Especially if it's a laminate bow, you can mm -hmm. call what they call delamination, and it's a good way to blow a bow up. Yeah. We had one September crown where someone's bow ended up on the ground under the bow stand because the limbs heated up so bad and it just melted and folded. So, okay. So onto the parts of a bow. Um, they look a little different on long bows and horse bows and recurves. This is very obvious. So I'm going to use this as my example because these are the limbs which are attached to what is called the riser. On long bows and horse bows, the, the riser is the part where you grab them. So it's the handle that's in the middle. Uh, some long bows, it's usually at least built up a little to show you where the handle is. Um, some of them, it's really hard to, to tell for sure. On the riser, we have, again, I'm trying to make sure that these are visible. We have the shelf, the cutout on this one. Not Again, as we talked about, not all bows have cutouts. If it has a cutout, this is referred to as the shelf, which is just the bottom part of the cutout. This one also has an arrow rest. So you could put a little, what they refer to as a rug or, or a piece of uh, stuff here that would let you shoot right off the shelf. We have an arrow rest so that we're shooting off the arrow rest. Uh, limbs, we already discussed that the... Um, the belly of the bow is the side of the bow that faces you, whereas the face of the bow is the part that faces the target. Uh, we have, this one actually has a string saver on it. So we have the limbs, or the tips, which is the area where the string goes around. Hey, do you have uh, And that's, we have the string, and the string in this case, because this is, yep. uh, so different types of strings. We have continuous loop strings, uh -oh. and we have what they call Flemish twist. Uh, continuous loop has serving out at the end and in the middle. Flemish twist okay. just tends to have it in the middle. The serving helps, again, preserve the life of the string because all the wear is happening on this serving material. Um, because that's where the arrow is knocking onto the string and, and coming off. Uh, any questions about parts of a bow? Okay. Um, equipment inspections. Again, this class is not to talk about how to do it. This class is intro to archery. So, um, the concept here is that we have rules uh, for target archery that say that the person running the range should inspect your archery equipment when you come on the range. You'll find that a lot of times we know each other and they're like, oh yeah, you've checked it, okay. Um, but if we see a new archer, we'll tend to walk over and say, could I take a look at that? And we'll do a quick inspection to see if we see any anything that looks like a flaw or a fault with the equipment that could be a safety risk. So when you guys are walking under ranges for the first time, expect that probably someone is going to approach you and just say, hey, can I look at some arrows? Can I look at your bow? 
Um, okay, so we have a question here. Does cold harm bows? Yes and no. So it depends on the bow and how it's made and what it's made out of. But certainly um, well, in Canada, I mean, they're out there shooting in awfully chilly weather and uh, they're shooting the same gear we are. So a lot of us, most of us will, will refuse to go to practice before we're at a point where the bow should be refusing to go to practice. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, but it can if you buy a, especially a new bow that a lot of them have information with it that all say things like what the brace height should be, which I should have covered on a bow. Brace height is the height between the arrow rest and the, where the string is once it's strung up. And there are ideal brace heights for each bow. Um, so if you buy a new bow, usually that information is in the, the um, little manual or little paper they give you with it and it will probably indicate temperature you know ideal temperatures and uh, temperatures to avoid if not you can probably go on the manufacturer's site and look it up for older bows some of that is still online i was actually able to find my black widow documentation online but not all bows have that so some point it's a best guess and what are you comfortable with Okay, um, so equipment inspections, accessories, and I didn't grab any of these. So um, most people shoot, we encourage you to have something on your fingers. Um, usually you use a bow glove, which is three finger glove. Um, some people use finger tabs and those literally hook on, oh, there's a tab. So tabs are designed, they literally hook on a finger and then you just hold them against the string. And then gloves are designed to actually cover all the way, and then they'll usually have Velcro to attach at the back. Uh, and then they have leather reinforced fingertips. Again, the idea is to protect your fingers from, from the uh, bowstring. Some people choose not to use them, and we had, there's no rule requiring them. Oh, look, yay. So yes, uh, on these, you'll notice again, these, this is darker because there's actually thicker leather added to the top to help prevent in finger issues from the string. Uh, some of the interesting finger issues you can have mostly, it's blisters, of course. Um, that one's probably fairly obvious, but we've also had people who put in their knuckle too much and they've actually ended up with nerve damage because of pinching the nerve right in the knuckle. So again, we recommend gloves or, or tabs to help protect you. Um, we also recommend bracers. Um, if you think about how you're holding a bow, string in one hand, bow in the other, the bow glove goes on the string hand, the bracer goes on the bow hand, bow arm. Uh, bracers, most of what we use tend to be leather. Um, a lot of us have made our own thanks to um, various people having bracer making classes and such. Um, they're, are some store-bought ones you can get like Cabela's and that. They have some that are an elastic band and they're they're usually like a little plastic piece with some uh, material coating over it. Uh, all of them work, all of them are allowed. Uh, uh, yes, there's an example of a leather bracer. Ah, and an example of dumping a quiver of bolts on the floor. <laughs> okay. Um, Just before we leave the the bracer, I think it's important to note for again for people just starting out that it's a, in my experience it's much more important for the women to have the bracer than, than it is for the men, and the reason for that is that women have got a a, a wonky elbow. The, if you look at, a, at the way a man's uh, arm is. Uh, is uh, stressed or, or, or made and extended to uh, to its limit, the actual elbow uh, has still got a little bit of a kink in it. Whereas a woman, if you can have a look at, yeah, see, see yeah. Um, Athelina's, the, uh, the elbow is a sort of almost a reverse thing. It's sticking back out towards sure. the bow. 
So what he's describing is for, for most of us, if we hold our arm out, our elbow actually bends this way. For women, it tends to bend this way. Our which elbows means, tend to hyperextend. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. So you can have the knob of your elbow out or you can have just your your elbow sticking out from hyperextending, um, which is a prime spot to get lots of bow bites and lots of pain. Um, a lot of us use bracers anyway. We they're, Again, they are not required. Some people use that as their tell that, hey, I'm releasing wrong because it hit my arm this time. Uh, so again, recommended, not required. Uh, let's see, so on bows, talking about actual shooting. So when you put the arrow on the string, we refer to that as knocking the arrow because you're taking the knock of the arrow and not putting it onto the string. Most of us have this, which is referred to as a knock set or a knock bead, and that tells us where to put the arrow. You can, depending on your preference, you can knock above or you can knock below. Uh, and it's important to know that which you prefer when you're setting the knock bead because it goes in a different place accordingly. Um, there is, again, no preference. Almost everyone I've run into does knock under, um, but some people do knock over. There's, again, nothing I've seen to, to uh, say that you can't do it either way. So it comes down to preference. Uh, let's see, Archer's Paradox. Again, we're not going into the science of it. This is an intro class. And to be honest, I don't know if I could go into the science of it and I've been shooting for a while. But the general idea is, as you saw in that bow, it's a, what they call a center cut. It's cut out as a shelf. So you're shooting almost straight through the bow at the target. When you're shooting period gear, the bow liter or the arrows literally spined in such a way that it flexes and bends around the bow and then it does this fishtail thing as it straightens back out towards the target and that's what the archer's paradox is is how much that arrow bends around the bow as it heads to the target um, if you have well matched arrows to your bow then it should feel like you're shooting straight at the target if they're going off to in terms of being a right-handed archer, if they're going off to the left, then they're probably overly spined. They're not bending around the bow, so they're going straight, uh, straight off the bow, off to the side. If they're going extra far right, that means they're not spined heavy enough, uh, so they're over flexing. And then the concerns are a little bit of either of those is not going to cause any issue. You just have to adjust the way you shoot for them. If you get too light of a spine, it can literally snap the arrow when you lose, which can then cause injuries. And so you do want to be careful about making sure your arrows are at least somewhat close to what the bow weight is. When it's much too light, it will effectively blow up yeah. I had I was teaching a student and they brought over gear to me and said here they handed me this and drew loose and the thing blew apart it was three or four pieces it, by the end of it the, the bow was just too much power for the poor little arrow yeah and we've also seen that uh, at archery fest we had who was it? Dax and Lang. Dax always makes their flight arrows, and so they're out for the flight shoot, and they each loose and just poof, arrows gone because he had made them too thin and too light, and they just disintegrated basically on shooting. When you purchase arrows, that's one of the pieces of information you need to uh, to give the person that's selling them to you is the the power of your bow, uh, and then they should match the arrows to the, the the diameter of the arrows to the uh and also material in the arrow uh to the bow that you 
intend to use it on. Yep. Okay, on to range calls. So what can you expect? You, you've you've got gear, whether it's yours or loaner, and, and you're ready to shoot. And um, what you'll tend to hear on an SCA range, and it varies slightly by kingdom, and on tiers rules are slightly reversed of society rules now because of the way society rules were written. Um, You'll hear some sort of call declaring that the range is open or that it's safe to shoot. Um, a lot of us in Ontario use uh, ranges open archers to the line. Uh, ranges open, you may shoot at will, you may shoot at your leisure, something like that that indicates, okay, you can step up and shoot. Then the range at the end of people shooting, the range is called closed. And again, that's usually something along the lines of range is closed, bows down. And then they usually wait till make sure people have, or it's bows down, range closed, either order. Um, then we may wait and make sure bows are being put on the bow stand. And then we say, okay, you can retrieve your arrows. Uh, we don't carry bows down range. And that can be something that especially uh, scouts will want to do because in scouting they do. Uh, so we kind of watch for that when we see new archers who say, yeah, I've learned in scouts. It's like, okay, <laughs> keep an extra eye because they are probably out of habit just going to walk down range with the bow. Oh, Thomas of Salisbury is waiting in the lobby. He got disconnected. Okay, right. sorry about that interruption. Um, and then there will be another call in there there should be, which is clear down range. And that's actually a call down range to make sure nobody's down there. So if you as a new archer are behind a target, but looking for arrows bent over and you hear that call, stand up and indicate, no, it's not clear down range. I am here. Um, it may be that you forgot to put up a, uh, an arrow in the target, but which we use as a flag to indicate that you're going behind, uh, happens all the time. Uh, it may be that the person didn't see it when they scanned, that you have an arrow there and they just, for some reason, they didn't see it. And, and so they thought the range was clear. So we added that call specifically as a double check, is the range really clear before we say people can shoot. Um, in on tier, it is standard practice that we straddle the shooting line. Uh, some kingdoms and Scouts used to, I understand they're actually changing their rules, but they used to tow into the line. Uh, so again, watch and make sure for us as those of us who are marshals, we tend to watch and make sure people are actually straddling the line before they start shooting. You don't knock an arrow on your bow until you're straddling the line because otherwise you're behind people with a loaded weapon. So much the way you don't load your, your gun if you're at a, a gun range until you're actually sitting in the, the position to start shooting, you don't load your bow behind the line where people are in front of you. Uh, let's see. So standard scoring that you would intend to encounter when you're first starting is scoring is one through five. It's white, black, blue, red, gold. So um, fairly straightforward. If you break the line between the colors, you get that next color up. You get the highest one because we score in the archer's favor four royal rounds. If someone's running a tournament, they can call the scoring however they want to. So they can score it in the archer's um, uh, against the archer and say, nope, if you hit between the lines, it's the lowest. Or they could say if you didn't clearly land in one solid color, it's no points. I mean, Rules can always be played with and changed for tournaments and, and stuff like that. That's part of the challenge and the fun of them. Let's see, we respecting other archers arrows. We don't pull other archers arrows unless we ask permission first because they may be scoring. They may be sighting in and they, even though it's in the ground, they want to know where it landed so they can adjust their aiming for the next end. Uh, one thing we will tend to do if we see it flat in the ground is pull it out and kind of stick it up like a flag so that people don't step on it, but they can still see where it had landed. Um, 
we have had occasionally people go up and trying to be helpful and pulling all the arrows out of the target. And then the people who were scoring said, where was this in the target? Well, I don't know. I was pulling them for you. So then they end up having to reshoot that in for their score because. So again, ask for permission before you mess with other people's arrows, unless, like I said, if it's a safety issue, like someone's going to step on this, pull it out and stick it up as a flag in the ground. Uh, see, yes, Seth, we know. Just to note, when you're pulling an arrow out of the ground, or really anywhere, um, make sure you pull it straight back along the line that it went in. Um, I've definitely had, uh, I've seen new archers go and try and pull an arrow out of the ground and they lever it up and it breaks halfway. Um, so make sure that it goes back along the line that it went into wherever it ended up. So straight back. Or if the fletches are covered, try and find the tip and pull it out the other or, end because otherwise you yeah. ruin the fletches. But yeah, good point. Yeah, no levering it to yeah. get it places because it'll just break. Probably the ground is more solid than the arrow. Yep. Yep. So, uh, sorry, I might have missed it. I was having some technical difficulties, but when you're pulling your own arrows, the other thing is grip it close as close as you can to the target and try and put a hand on the target face. Otherwise, you tend to like rip the paper off of the whatever target it's affixed to. So it's just a way to keep things all secure. And if you try pulling from the back of the arrow, you tend to torque the arrow and risk breaking it. Yep. OK, let's see, respecting others, arrows in the so I already mentioned this. If we're going behind the bales, we stick an arrow up in the top of the bales as a flag. Uh, that way the marshal knows or hopefully can see it and knows someone's behind. Uh, is there let's someone see. who should be removing their arrows first, or is this the first person who gets so, there? Or? So usually it's the first person who gets there. If there are a lot of arrows, like if let's say, you know, there's five or ten people who have shot the same target, usually you start with whoever's are the furthest out. Because if you have people trying to reach through everyone else's arrows to grab stuff in the center, they're more likely to, to damage the arrows they're reaching through. And very frequently you can get one person on each side of the target and start working on them. They might not necessarily, you won't want to necessarily be reaching all the way across to the far side if you're doing that, but it can help speed pulling a little bit to do that. The other thing I'll mention is that if you do see an arrow on the ground and it's not very obvious, you might want to just call out and say, you know, there's an arrow with, you know, a blue and a yellow fletch here just in case. So yeah, I mentioned if you see one in the ground, pull it out and stick it straight up and down as a flag so the ar archer can still see where it landed, but it's less likely to be stepped on. Yeah, I've and found obvi actually, obviously, sorry, go ahead. It's not always a good idea to try and jam somebody's <laughs> arrow back into the ground because you can't snap them. Especially so sometimes in August. <laughs> your, your better choice is to say, you know, watch for shorts. You've got one right here. Point it out as you're you're continuing to move. Yeah. I was going to say, just obviously make sure no one's behind you when you're pulling an arrow out. Uh, yeah. Yes. And be aware of where arrows are. If you're bending over to pull one like out of the ground at the base of the target, I, I may have cut myself once or twice on someone's plastic knock because I didn't see it there and I bend down to grab mine. And yeah, <laughs> definitely need to have awareness. And it's easy if someone's pulling it for it to suddenly come loose and, you know, like you're saying, don't be right behind them because they, they can jab you with the, the arrow as it suddenly comes loose from the target. Yes, Athelina. And when you're pulling from the target, I mean, make sure you're pulling, you know, in the right direction, but also look behind you every single time you mm -hmm. pull. Look behind <laughs> yes. to make sure somebody didn't jam their face up there trying to see what their score is in the, in, in the meantime. Yes. Good point. Yep. Because some Couple of other things can be fixated on what did, how did I shoot? And yeah, don't realize what's going on. So yeah, a couple other things. If you're shooting in particular with hay bales, if you hit right on the seam, your arrow might go through. If you are scoring at that point, there are ways to actually kind of figure out where it went through. 
I don't know if you want to talk about that, Tim. Nope. And then the other one is that if your arrow pierces through where there's a portion of the fletch that has gone through the paper target, do not pull it backwards. You need to pull it all the way through the bale. Otherwise, you'll ruin your fletches. Yeah. Robert. One small note that you brought up is, it, you know, a, a, something else you should have in your accessory bag is a couple pieces of gauze, a Band-Aid, and some antibiotic, because you will eventually mess up. Just a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> From the former chirogenet. <laughs> Someone's going to help me with the rest of the class here. Okay, uh, shooting during timed in. So different places handle that differently, even within our kingdom. Uh, most of us, timed ins are just a natural part of everything, and we don't care. I have seen sometimes where people insist that the timed ins have to be run absolutely separately from anything else. Um, it's kind of up to the marshal running the range at that point. Uh, there's no rule requiring one or the other. Uh, timed ends, just so you kind of have an idea when you uh, step on range what's going on is there's a five second count in, you have 30 seconds to shoot, and then there's a, at the, the last five seconds, there's a five second count out. So uh, you end up with a 30 second period to actually lose however many arrows you want to try to loose in that time. Uh, as we previously mentioned, as a new archer, you're better off keeping your pace and finding aim points and getting the points rather than trying to hurry and get a bunch off. Um, but if you shoot before they tell you to start or loose and you shoot after, let me change that, or you shoot after they say to cease or stop, you end up losing your highest point scoring arrow that you did get off during the timed end because you shot outside of the 30 seconds that you're allowed. Again, more of that would be, would they would go over with you at an event or practice when you're actually preparing to shoot one. So I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, let's see, do not shoot across other people's arrows. Much as it seems like it would be hard to do that, it's been, uh, we've caught ourselves a couple times recently at our practice range, well, when we were still open, uh, where someone shoots at such an angle to the target that you step up because, well, it's clear to stand here and shoot that target. And what you realize is they're standing over to the right shooting the left side 40 and you're standing in front of the right side 40 shooting it so they're actually shooting across your arrows and uh as everard can attest to since he and i did this it isn't pretty when the arrows hit midair and and explode um neither of you gets any points for it and you're down an arrow so uh, we make sure either if that's the situation and you recognize it either wait for them to sh finish shooting or if you guys can time it you can each loose offset from each other so you can still shoot at your target but without risking having arrow collision uh, any questions on any of that we're nearing the end uh, calling hold, reasons we call it and what to do if one is called. So usually, um, as uh, Kieran knows, um, hold is a magic SCA word, so it means some sort of safety issue. Uh, on archery ranges, we, it can be anywhere from someone's pet just ran in onto the target range, uh, some kid just ran under the safety rope onto the target range, uh, Someone just popped out in the back of the range because there's actually a walking trail in the woods behind it. Um, someone dropped their arrow on the target side of the line and is now leaning forward, putting their head in front of someone's bow to grab their arrow that they dropped on the target side of the line. Uh, someone has their arrow knocked behind the line, so they now have a loaded weapon behind you. These are all possible reasons it's called. Uh, within archery, what we do when one is called is if we're 
getting ready to shoot, we let the string down slowly, we unknock the arrow, we step off the shooting line, we look for what's going on, we wait to hear from someone that the issue is cleared and we can resume before we straddle the line again and shoot. We also encourage people to echo the hold call because we have had situations where we found out later that three people down at one end of the shooting line knew there was a hold call and none of the other 10 or 15 people on the rest of the line ever heard it. So if you hear a hold, echo the hold while you're taking your arrow off and, and getting off the shooting line. Hey, Tim. Yeah. A uh, couple of things. I don't remember if you mentioned it, but anyone can call a hold, not just the marshal. If anyone yep. sees the safety issue, call hold. Just it's better to be air on the side of caution. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention is on timed rounds, there's sort of a legacy way of calling timed rounds, and some marshals still do this, where when they end the 30 second timed end, that they say hold. And I personally try and discourage people from doing it, but some people get really grumpy when you, you know, that they want to continue calling hold is the end of it. But they use that as a way to stop the timed end as opposed to actually using it for a range safety command. And you just almost have to be aware. So if you're hearing, you know, five, four, three, two, one, hold, you have to interpret whether it's a range safety issue or we're ending the timed end. Yeah. That is true. The first time I heard that, I was like, wait, what? Oh, oh, OK, that they're doing that. Got it. That's become yeah, you can rarer get people and rarer. Get really hot under the collar if you call them on that. They, they just say it's allowed. You know, don't say this. Yeah. Or don't say it's a bad thing. So actually, it's written that it's not to be used in our book rule book. But um, OK, hair and clothing safety. So really loose sleeves, braids, loose long hair. All of this is stuff that can really nicely wrap around a bowstring and try and take it and you downrange with your arrow. As uh, Avina can attest to having given herself whiplash from trying to shoot her braid downrange. Um, so make sure your hair's tied back in a way that it's secure. If you have to, you know, if you have braids, if you can tuck them in the back of your, your dress or garb, uh, tuck them up in a hat, uh, clip them together behind you. Uh, you know, uh, again, the bracer can help hold loose sleeves tighter so that it can help keep loose sleeves out of the way. Um, they sell things called blousers that can be used to wrap around a sleeve to help bundle it and tighten it up. Uh, so all of that is basically an awareness of anything loose wearing jewelry. Great, great thing if you're drawing like this for, for a string to catch jewelry as it goes by. Uh, so just having an awareness of anything loose and sticking out that you can, you know, tuck those in or whatever, just to make sure that they're not going to become a victim to your bowstring. Uh, any questions or comments to add on that one? No, OK, accommodations. So our rules are fairly well and fairly strictly written. You straddle the line before you knock an arrow. You don't uh, take the line till it's called open. Um, it's all fairly prescriptive rules for the sake of safety at, uh, of the range. We also, of course, want to let anyone shoot who wants to. And um, I've run into a couple situations where that meant modifying the rules a little bit for them. So understanding, you know, us having an understanding of the purpose of the rule. So we all straddle the line and stand upright. The whole rule of not grabbing your arrow is if you lean forward, you could now be in front of someone's bow that's at full draw. So I had a person that I was working with and they couldn't stand upright. They stood in what you would kind of think of as more of a, a hunter type stance or um, it, even almost a version of a, a war bow type stance where they're leaning forward to get enough power to draw the bow. 
So in that case, we made an accommodation and we had them tow into the line instead of straddling it so that when they were down in this position, their head wasn't in front of the next person's bow. They were even with the line. Um, shooting off a chair, shooting off out of a wheelchair. These are things that accommodations can be made for. And uh, as archers, we may have to kind of, you know, shift where we're standing to make sure they have room to get in and, and set up and shoot also. So, uh, and the, the other point of that obviously is if you know someone who wants to try, uh, I don't think it applies to anyone here, but if you know someone who has it, some disabilities and wants to try, we can work with them and try and find a way that's safe for them to participate too. Uh, let's see, the last thing that I had for this was, so the idea is you walk on a range, you're new, maybe you need to get loaner gear, maybe you have some questions, um, recognizing people on the range. So the, the most obvious will be the range marshal because they're gonna be the one calling the range. Sometimes they're wearing a baldric or something or have a pole to indicate who they are. Sometimes they don't. So sometimes you're literally waiting for someone to start making calls and looking around going, who is it? Okay, it's them. And that's always a go-to person that can probably either answer questions or direct you to someone. Um, Within on tier, we have the Order of the Grey Goose Shaft, which is both skill and service oriented. So a lot of the people are willing to teach or again, at least have been doing this long enough that they could probably say, oh, you want to know about this particular thing. You should talk to that guy over there or that lady over there or, you know, you should get in touch with so-and-so who isn't here right now, but they, they're going to be the best source. So. Uh, OGGS is designated by a white bracer. Uh, hey, look, I'm going to pull double duty with the same bracer. So white bracer, in this case, this one is upside down. But so hers actually has the goose on it with the uh, four arrows. Uh, mine is literally just a white bracer with my comets on it. So if you see a white bracer, that is an indication of a member of the order who can be a go-to person if you, the marshal's busy and you're looking for someone else that you want to ask questions. Uh, students also can be. Red Bracers is a student or an Arcarius. Um, again, usually by the time you're one or the other, you've been around SEA ranges for a while, so you can probably at least answer basic questions or direct people and help out. So uh, I like to point them out as like, you're totally new to SCR archery. You walk into a range and you're going, who can help answer this question or tell me or guide me? Or These are some of the people that you could quickly identify who could help you. Again, as I mentioned at the start, we are an overzealous and overeager group of people. And we are probably all willing to help out. And if you ask anyone on the range, someone's going to jump in and help you. And maybe everyone is going to jump in and help you, depending. So... Um, you know, uh, by no means am I saying you should talk to a goose or an Arcarius or the range marshal. I'm just identifying them as people you could quickly spot that might be someone to ask questions of. Um, as new archers, one, sort of uh, one second, Thomas. As new archers, one thing I will point out is part of that overzealousness is I have seen people literally driven from archery ranges because everyone kept coming over and teaching them. Be very aware that you have every right to tell someone, nope, I'm working with someone or I don't need help right now. I'm not looking for information right now. I'm, you know, I'm doing something. We're not trying to overwhelm you. We're all trying to help. And if you can point out that, nope, thanks. I, I've got enough help. I don't need any more right now. Too many voices, you know, you have, please do that. Don't feel like, oh, geez, I'm new here. I just have to let everyone talk to me. And, and, and I'm, no, we don't want you feeling overwhelmed and not wanting you to come back. We want you to enjoy it and come back. Okay, Thomas, you had something? Yeah, just uh, regarding the OGGS, the one thing for a newcomer is that the white bracer and the red bracer are reserved for people who are members of that order. So you should not be wearing one of those colors on a bracer until you are a member of that order. So pick any other color. Yep. 
Yeah, much the way a, a heavy fighter wouldn't show up on a, a, a fighting field wearing a white belt because that would be presumptuous. Um, now, there are some exceptions. I've seen some people who bought a store-bought one that was like brown leather through here, and then the sides were a leather, a red suede, I think it was, and it actually ended up with kind of a pinkish red. It's like, you know what? That is not a red bracer. We are not going to confuse that. Go for it. But, yeah. Any questions or any other topics anyone thinks that uh, we should cover? It's been kind of long and a lot of information, so uh, good job on, on, on sticking through all this. Okay, if there are no questions, I am going to maybe, maybe not, just a moment.